Hi, this is John Starks, and you're watching Real Fans, Real Talk. Real Fans, Real Talk.com. Where Arthur Domus trip young and intern time for the white and black fans. Asia to Manhattan. I get all my facts from my bro, Mark the Stats Man. If you're not tuned in, I recommend the CAT scan. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And if your brain checks out, then you deserve a backhand. Sports, <laughs> gossip, all the hot topics. Hey, hey. Real Fans, Real Talk.com. Got it. Uh -huh. They got the hottest bloggers. Did Jeremy Lynn hurt? We'll log on to the site and you can hear it from them first. I'm talking about the latest. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about the greatest. Yeah, yeah. Go check out the art. Even tell a neighbor, tell a body sent ya From spring to winter, tuning in should be the only thing on your agenda Certified cosign, you know what I'm about son Real fans, real talk dot com, I'm out one Real fans, real talk, real fans, real talk Real fans, real talk dot com Real fans, real talk dot com Real fans, real talk Real fans, real talk Real fans, real talk dot com Real fans, real talk dot com Hello everyone, Mark the Statman Skevich Real fans, real talk here with one of the iconic Knicks legends One of my personal favorite players The one and only John Starks Thank you for coming on to the program well, Thank you for having me Great to see you out here supporting the kids, still being involved with the Knicks organization, uh, supporting the family on three. Now, what m motivated you to get involved with uh, charity events like this? Uh, you know, uh, I've been doing a lot of charity events uh, pretty much my whole career, you know, along with, you know, my foundation. Uh, then, obviously, uh, Anthony, Anthony Jr. had started this foundation for his father in honor of his father, and so... Um, we just wanted to uh, collaborate and uh, do something for uh, the area out here. Now, let's talk about your career a little bit for the, some of the younger folks out there that might not be familiar. You had a very illustrious career with the Knicks. It didn't start out so illustrious. You started with Golden State. Things didn't work out too well. You left the NBA for a bit. You tried out for the Knicks. And then there's the... Uh, you know, one of the few people where an injury actually did good for your career. You, you tried to dunk on Patrick Ewing, which is, you, you, I got to admire it, definitely. But uh, can you tell us what was going on in your mind at that practice when you tried to dunk on him? Well, it was the last day of cuts, and so I felt like, uh, you know, I had a, a pretty good uh, uh, preseason, but you never know. Uh, I thought that I possibly would stick with the team. But I just wanted to uh, do something very special that last day. Came in with the attitude like this is a playoff uh, playoff game and uh, just wanted to impress the coaches a little bit more. And so I got an opportunity on a breakaway to go up and, and uh, dunk the basketball. And uh, I tell this story all the time. I forget Patrick Ewing, the seven-footer who could jump. And so he got to the rim a little quicker than what I expected. And uh, he caught my dunk. I came down and twist my, my knee. But... Uh, in doing so, uh, I w it gave me an opportunity to get on the injured reserve, which I didn't know if you put on the injured reserve, they couldn't cut you. So it gave, gave me an opportunity to stick around and, and be around the team until I got a chance to uh, uh, play. And uh, speaking of dunks, you have an, uh, a much more famous dunk that is actually just simply called the dunk. Like, I mean... It's, it's almost the definition of posterizing, dunking, especially Jordan and Horace Grant. You had the pick coming, uh, you, you, you faked left, you went right baseline, dunked on Jordan and Horace Grant. I have the poster personally when I was growing up. Uh, what does it feel like to have a dunk known as the dunk? Well, it feels good. Obviously, um, it wasn't something that I was expecting, uh, but... Uh, you know, you hear in the media capital of the world, and uh, they come up with some great sayings. And so uh, that particular play happened during the playoffs in 1993 against the Chicago Bulls. And uh, it was just a play that just was spontaneous. and nothing uh, that, you know, coming down the court to say I'm going, I'm going to go in there and dunk on Horace Grant and Michael Jordan. It just the opportunity presented itself, and I just – Went to the hole hard and knew I had to go in strong and completed one of the most memorable plays in uh, New York Knicks, Knicks history. Definitely in basketball history as well. Um, now, when we interviewed Anthony Mason Sr., he had some interesting stories uh, with Pat Riley, some funny stories. You had the privilege of playing for one of the coaching greats in history. Any funny stories out there with, with Pat Riley? or? 
Well, not too many funny stories. Uh, coach Riley was uh, obviously a very serious uh, coach. And, uh, you know, throughout the course of uh, four years, five years, that we got a chance to uh, be around him. Um, it was just incredible. You know, he's a man of uh, uh, great integrity, uh, a, f a very focused individual, uh, very prepared as far as getting his teams ready to go out there and uh, compete night in and night out and a very intense coach and so uh, those teams uh, that I played on along with uh, Anthony Anthony he was some incredible teams you know the 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 strength the mental strength that we had during that time and the ferociousness that we had out there on the court uh, came from coach Riley you know and that's the team that he wanted to uh, put together to represent New York uh, because this is a city a blue collar city and a hard working city and so he wanted to make sure that we was a hard-working team that represented this city in a very uh, fine way. Now, the Knicks had a little bit of a, well, a pretty big problem, the same problem everyone else had in the league, and that was called Michael Jordan. But he did retire, uh, and the very following season, as a lot of people predicted, you guys made the NBA Finals, 94, the Rangers win the Stanley Cup. Can you tell us what the mindset was for you going in, the New York City buzzing between the Rangers and Knicks both making it to the Finals? Well, it was an exciting time during that time. Obviously, uh, the Knicks as well as the Rangers was in the Finals at the same time. You know, I, I, I talked to people during that time, fans, say they didn't sleep for about two months, you know, because when we was on uh, one night, the Rangers were on the next night. And so it was just an incredible uh, feeling in the city. Wherever you go, couldn't buy a meal, couldn't buy a drink, you couldn't buy nothing uh, for yourself. So uh, it was a lot of fun times. Uh, just going into that finals, you know, we felt like that we had a great team and that we worked very hard to get to that point. And we had a, a great opportunity to uh, – bring a championship here to New York and so uh, but we was going up against a great opponent in the Houston Houston Rockets and uh, with one of the arguably one of the greatest centers of all time in uh, Kim Olajuwon and they had a very solid team you know we was evenly matched uh, you know we played the same style of basketball and uh, it was just a team that um, you know who wanted it the most uh, you know we wanted it just as much as they did uh, just unfortunately, especially in Game 7, the worst game that I possibly could have. Uh, I didn't play as well as I wanted to do, uh, obviously. But uh, but it was it was a lot of fun, you know, going and be able to compete for a title and, and knowing that you got the opportunity to bring a title home. Now, you mentioned Game 7, but right before that, Game 6, you had an opportunity to win it. Yeah. And I remember as a kid yelling at the TV, you kind of looked like you were laughing a little bit afterwards. I'm like, what the hell are you laughing about? I mean, I know now as an adult, sometimes yeah. when things go wrong, you just kind of like, oh, my God. Like, yeah. um, so, but what was going on through your mind that last three, game six, uh, after not, you know, you know, I believe it was blocked by Hakeem Elijah one. Yeah. What, what was going on in your mind? No, it wasn't. It was just a smirk, you know what I mean, that he got to the – got to that shot, you know what I mean, because I thought I cleared cleared him and uh, had enough space uh, to get the shot off. And uh, it felt good when it left left my hand. He just got his fingertips on it. Uh, we'd be sitting here talking about Knicks as champions right now. Uh, but, you know, it took a great player to make a great defensive play. Uh, and he probably – probably one other player probably could have made that play is probably David Robinson from a center standpoint because they're – very agile and quick and could jump out the gym. So, um, but it was just unfortunate that we didn't uh, uh, didn't get the championship. But, you know, we just keep fighting, you know, year after year like we're doing right now. And uh, hopefully uh, we can get to that point uh, where we do bring a championship here to New York. Now, the following year, I mean, you already talked about Game 7. I know, do you feel actually before we move on, um, that that block, did that affect your mindset going into game seven or it was just nothing to do with it? Nothing to do with it, you know what I mean? It just, when you know, when you're preparing yourself to uh, play uh, a game seven, you know, you have to, you know, go into that mindset like, okay, this is all for the for the ball of wax and, and, and don't put as much pressure on yourself. Just go out there and play a normal game. Uh, and just looking back uh, during that game seven, I probably put a little bit more pressure on myself to go out there and compete 
uh, do the same thing I did in game number six. And whenever you do that, you don't go out and play a relaxed ball game. And and I didn't go out and play a relaxed ball, ball game. I wanted it, as, as if you can say that, wanted it too much. And you didn't go out there and just let things happen. And so uh, I would say that I was at the finish line before I ran the race uh, during that during that game right there. So, uh, but you know, like I say, things happen like that. And but you don't let things like that destroy you. You move on, and you try to come back even stronger. Now, the blame was kind of on you by Knicks fans. The following year, the blame kind of fell on Patrick Ewing for the missed finger roll. And, you know, to the people out there that said he should have dunked it, I mean, if you look at the replay, dunking was not an option. It wasn't like he was right underneath yeah, the yeah. basket, wide open, and tried to put a layup when he could have dunked it. So that's just a little ridiculous. And also people kind of forget about the uh, – the fact that he made the game winner in game five and, you know, in order to even get to that point to stay alive and, and, the, yeah, and, and won in game six and then taking it to game seven. Um, he, missed the game, he missed that shot and then now Pat Riley uh, leaves afterwards. He retires. Now, do you think that the following year or the years to come, you know, if Pat Riley would have stayed, that you guys would have been made it back to the finals or won? That's here to say. You know what I mean? We got a bad break the following year. Uh, you know, Coach Riley did what he had to do. You know, he got a great offer, you know, $40 million. Who's going to turn that down as a coach and to be able to have uh, part of the team? And so, um, you know, I don't think anyone was upset about his decision for his players because we know, you know, it, it kind of ran its course a little bit, and coaches know that. Certain coaches know that because Coach Riley's system is a very demanding system, and you have to have a lot of player turnover in order to keep keep that fresh and and not be drowned out by what he's saying. And so, he he's been in this game long enough to understand that he pushes as far as he could push us. And now we needed a new voice uh, in the locker room. And so uh, I have no ill feeling towards Coach Riley leaving. And, um, you know, but we had an opportunity, you know, after he left uh, when Jeff was there uh, to be able to get back. Unfortunately, we had a couple of incidents with Miami uh, that cost us uh, two series, uh, 96 and 97, I want to say. Um, you know, but it, it is what it, what it was back then. Now, the finger roll layup, the Pacers end up moving on to play the Orlando Magic. The 30 for 30 documentary just came out about the Magic team. Now, I personally felt that if Ewing would have made the layup, went to overtime, I think you guys could have beaten that Orlando Magic team. What do you think? Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, we, we had a lot of confidence. And, and uh, you know, like I say, it just comes down to really miss or makes in this game right here. Uh, people don't understand what it took for Patrick to even play in that game, you know what I mean? He had to get his knee drained uh, the day of the game and and for him to play uh, basically on one leg, uh, you know, I can't say enough about his heart and what he meant to us as our leaders. And so um, if we could have got to Orlando, yeah, well, well, I felt like that we went back to the championship and that would have been great because we got a chance to face Houston again and redeem ourselves. All right. Now, one of the reasons why the Orlando Magic got swept that year is because, you know, they were going up against the more experienced team, the Houston Rockets. I feel you guys could have beaten the Magic as well. But do you think rematch Houston Rockets, you would have taken it all the way? Yeah, we felt like that we were going to beat them this next time around. We had a little bit more incentive, obviously, losing the year before. And so, yeah, we felt like that we had team was a little bit more experienced for the, for the final uh, push. Uh, coming in, still had D Harp, and uh, we had some very solid players on our team. So, yeah, we felt like that if we got back there, I was looking forward to get back there, obviously, to redeem myself uh, during that final, but it just didn't work out. 
All right, for those of you who want to know the stats on that hypothetical Magic Knicks, I looked into the archives. They actually, you guys actually split the regular season two games and two games and took them to overtime in one of the home games. So for all of you doubters out there, it was definitely a reality that they could have beaten that Magic team. Now you have the dunk. You got a lot of great moments as a Nick. Uh, is there any other moments that aren't as famous as the dunk that, you know, kind of stand out in your Knicks career? Not really. Uh, you know, I'm all about team. Uh, really wasn't about individual. Probably uh, winning the Sixth Man of the Year award uh, just because uh, uh, that year I had to uh, come off the bench uh, because Allen came. Uh, that's probably was the most gratifying from an individual standpoint. Uh, but, you know, as a team, we accomplished a lot during that era, and uh, we are uh, appreciative that we had time to play with one another and uh, the friendships that we developed uh, during that time still st sticks to this day. So, um, you know, only thing, like I say, well, if I ever had to go back in time and change is that Akeem didn't block that shot and we have a championship. So other than that, yeah. I would like that to go back in time and change that too. So another thing around that time, uh, there's NBA Jam, like, the the video game like what did it feel like being part of a video game i know even the players nowadays it's 2k uh playing with them their own character in a video game what was that like uh it was great i, I didn't really play video games uh i put that down once i left uh high school uh but yeah no it was great obviously uh seeing yourself come to life and animation and and watching kids come up to you and, and tell you tell you that uh, they playing you every night. I'm like, how you playing me every night? I'm playing you on, uh, on a video game. I like, you know, that's, that's special, you know what I mean? Because, you know, those type of things you don't even think about growing up. You know, all you're thinking about is putting that ball in the basket and getting better at what you do. And so to be able to, you know, um, have that in your life and to be able to understand now that you grew up watching Dr. J, now these kids growing up uh, admiring you. Yeah, I was one of those kids, and uh, this is definitely a surreal moment being able to, to interview you and, uh, you know, Starks for three in the, in the NBA Jam uh, commentary with Marv Albert and everything. But you're known for the three-point shooting. You actually had um, the, the first player to hit 200. Now Steph Curry doubled that. Did you ever think that your record would be broken by that much? No, I'll be honest with you, I never did get into records. I didn't realize until probably about four or five years ago that I even hit 200 uh, threes uh, during a regular season. Uh, times are a little different uh, now, uh, the way you can get threes off. Uh, but he's just an incredible shooter, you know, because he shoots them. As soon as he step across the court, you know, you have to be up on him. And the way they play in defense nowadays is a little different than the way the way we played back then, you know, normally your big man is up on the screen. Now they kind of sit back in the lane and give you space uh, to come off that pick. And if you're wide open, if you're a shooter, you're going to knock down a lot of uh, three-pointers. And he does it the best. You know, I've been knowing Steph since he was young. And it's just uh, uh, fascinating to watch him play, play the game at the level that he's playing at right now. You talk about defense changing. I was saying you're known for the three. You're also a pretty tenacious defender, and you had the job of guarding Michael Jordan, Reggie Miller. What was that like having that uh, that job? Sleepless nights. <laughs> Sleepless nights. You know, those guys was obviously two of the best in the game and, and different styles, you know, because Reggie ran a lot and coming off picks and, doing, you know, crafty little things to get his shot off. And Michael, he don't run you off a lot of picks. He's just going to line you up and ask you can see if you can stop him or not. And so, uh, but which was hard to do. You know, my job with, especially with both of them, is that uh, all I did is try to make it hard for Mike and, and work to uh, uh, deny the ball to him and just make it tough on him. Reggie, you know, I had to really lock into him because he was always constant in motion. And those type of guys are always difficult to guard. And so uh, when I played him, I always just, you know, lock into him and let the other guys focus on their guys. I just didn't want to get him going because, as you know, once he, he gets going, he can be he can be a handful. Now, you said different styles. Who would you say is the toughest you've ever had to defend? Well, Reggie was the toughest to defend uh, from a standpoint 
uh, why I said like that Reggie was hard to defend because he was always running. And Michael was toughest to stop, you know, because he just, like I say, he's going to line you up and see if you can stop him or not. And so, uh, but Reggie running off the pick always was the hardest to defend. With Jordan, you could do everything right and he's still going to make the shot. Definitely great seeing you out here for the foundations. Can you tell us about your foundation? I know you come out for pretty much everything when it comes to charity, but tell us about your foundation. Well, my foundation was started back in 1994 uh, to uh, provide scholarships to uh, graduating high school students that's uh, truly trying to go to school and pursue their dreams. And, and so I wanted to uh, start this foundation to give them scholarship money to help out and assist with their education. And so uh, we've been very strong, obviously, since um, 1994. We didn't seen a lot of foundations come and go from, from an athletics, athlete standpoint. But, you know, this foundation has been very blessed with a lot of good support. A lot of uh, my peers come out and support uh, pretty much all my events. And so, uh, but we just want to, you know, give kids the opportunity to go on and, and truly uh, uh, realize their dreams and and so they can do something with their lives and so and make a positive impact on society and and um, you know for me personally you know I've been where they've been you know I wasn't you know recruited highly out of high school so I had to go the old-fashioned uh, route you know look for Pell grants and all those things in order to you know go to school and so I know the the process was very difficult and there was, wasn't a lot of money out there uh, during that time so uh, I'm just trying to do my part uh, and giving back uh, because God has given me this uh, platform uh, to be able to, uh, you know, help others. And so I think whenever you're given a platform, uh, you should do your best to, uh, you know, try to change people's lives. And that's what the foundation is about, is trying to give these kids an opportunity so they can change their lives for the better. Definitely. Now, can you tell the folks out there, more more information on how they could uh, donate to the charity? Well, you can go to johnstarks.org, and uh, we have all the information on. You can, um, you know, obviously donate online uh, to the foundation. And so, uh, you know, we're excited. Like I say, we're excited about all the things and all the programs that we have put in pl place over the years. And so uh, it's, uh, you know, a great thing, you know, moving forward with our foundation. And we just want to you know, make it bigger and better so we can send more kids to college. A couple of quick questions before I let you go. Um, you talked about education and everything. What do you think about uh, student athletes le uh, leaving early to, uh, to basically start an NBA career and the rules that they can't come out of high school anymore? Well, you know, it's, it's more like a lot of these kids that are leaving high school and it's not a high percentage of them back then when they were leaving early, stick in the NBA. And now in three years, you done, money then ran out, no education, then what you gonna do? And so unless you sure, <laughs> you're a sure shot, and it's hard to say if you're a sure shot or not, uh, school is the best thing for you. Getting your degree is the best thing because you can do so much with that. You know, if you don't make it to the NBA, you can, you know, coach, you can, work in the front office, you can do a lot of things uh, with that with that degree. Uh, but, you know, if you go to school and, and you come out, you go to school for what? To come out and get a good job. And if somebody offering you six, seven million dollars your first year out, uh, I think that's a good, yeah, good job. <laughs> pretty good job, you know what I mean? But, you know, once you get there though, I think uh, a lot of young, young uh, athletes forget that stop. You just have to, get even more uh, aggressive with, with what you're doing and honing your skills. Uh, I think, you know, I, I've been around young players and, and they think that they didn't made it and that's it. Uh, before they look up, you know, that third or fourth year come up, you're done, you know. And so uh, that's just because they forget it's a, you have to work even harder once you get to that level. Kobe Bryant was one of the players coming out of high school. You actually uh, matched up against him in his younger years. Did you ever think he'd, you know, blossom to become one of the greatest of all time? Uh, he had a he had the attitude. You know what I mean. He had a skill set. Uh, obviously, his father was a former NBA player, player Jelly Bean Joe Bryant, and uh, so he had all the credentials. Uh, but 
he also had a, a mentor in Michael Jordan and uh, someone who he looked up to, someone he patterned his game after, someone uh, who he has his mentality uh, to go out and, 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 and work hard and make himself into one of the best ever to play this game. Uh, you know, Kobe, he was special. He was very special, you know. One thing you can say about him, he never cheated the game. You know, he always came ready to play. Uh, he worked as hard as in practice as he did out there during game time. And, uh, you know, you got to appreciate that for him. So if any young player that exemplifies coming out of high school and what it took in order to stay uh, in the league, he would be the one. Him along with LeBron James is, is the same, same mentality. All right, last question, getting back to college. And do you think that college athletes should be paid? Yeah, I, I do. I do. You know, you have to give them uh, some type of siphon in order to, you know, do things that you have to do in college. You know, a lot of colleges is probably now seeing that, hey, if we don't take care of these guys, they're leaving early and we're not getting the full benefit of spending all this time recruiting them since they was in the seventh grade. And once they get here, they just one year and they're gone. And so uh, I think you have to give them – uh, some type of stipend in order for them to uh, live a little bit. I always tell them is, you know, athletes are res restricted by the NCAA for doing things as far as making money outside of of playing the sport, the respective sport that they play in. But they don't give that same type of uh, uh, situation for people that's going to school on music scholarships, that's going to school on academic scholarships. Those people are – able to go out and work and make a living and and do the things they have to do in order to uh, support themselves while they're in school. But the college athletes think that it was just about the sports, but you bring in millions and millions of dollars to this un these university and you don't get a share of that. They're selling your jerseys and all your paraphernalia that you get for millions and millions of dollars and you don't get a cut of that. You know what I mean? So why not give them money? You know, why not support them while they're in school or set up an education form uh, fund for them so when they do leave school, they have some money coming out, you know, for those who don't make it to the to the league or whatever respective league that they're trying to get into. Yeah, I'm on 100% agreement with you, especially the jersey sales. I mean, that's your name and you can't even make any money on it. It's, I think it's a little ridiculous. And it's also taken away from them taking advantage of the full education, which is, you know, what the scholarship is about anyway. They don't even get a full education because they're going to leave after, you know, two years or whatever the case may be because, you know, they can, they're can tired of living like that. So uh, definitely in agreement with you. Uh, speaking of jerseys, I do have a John Starks jersey, but I'm a lot bigger now, so it probably <laughs> would fit like <laughs> up to here. <laughs> but I'm one of the biggest fans of the Knicks, but a well-known uh, Knicks fan, Spike Lee, um, is obviously one of the faces of the franchise. What does Spike Lee mean to the Knicks? It means a, a lot. You know, he's obviously one of the Knicks' greatest fans and greatest supporters. And, you know, on that sideline, when you run out that tunnel, you always see Spike Lee during my time. He was always there, and he was the inspiration to a you know, all the players. Regardless, it was a great moment interviewing one of my uh, childhood favorite players, uh, John Starks. Uh, thank you for coming on to the program. All right, thank you for having me. All right, Mark the Statman Skevich alongside Nick's legend of John Starks. Real fans, real talk. We'll see you next time, everyone. Face facts, what up, what up? Real fans, real talk .com. Well, Arthur Domus, Trip Young, and Intern Tom for the white and black fans, Asia to Manhattan. I'll get all my facts from my bro, Mark the Stats Man. If you're not tuned in, I recommend the CAT scan. Uh -huh, and if uh -huh. your brain checks out, then you deserve a backhand. <laughs> Sports, gossip, all the hot topics. Hey, hey. Real fans, real talk got it. Uh -huh. They got the hottest bloggers. Did Jeremy Lynn hurt? We'll log onto the site and you can hear it from them first. I'm talking about the latest, yeah, I'm talking yeah. about the greatest. Yeah, yeah. Go check out the archives, even tell a neighbor, tell them about. Sent ya. From spring to winter, tuning in should be the only...